Good day. Thank you very much for joining us in this session. So the talk is about PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome, a modern medical quandary. I'm giving the task to start the talk on clinical impact of insulin resistance in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So for this particular topic, we'll be discussing primarily insulin resistance in patients with PCOS. These are my disclosures. And for this session, we would like to review the mechanisms of insulin resistance in patients with PCOS and review methods to establish its presence in PCOS. And next is to enumerate the clinical consequences of insulin resistance in PCOS and identify treatment options to address these problems. In the illustration are potential factors involved in the pathophysiology of PCOS. So as you can see in the middle, you have several factors that will affect stereogenesis. There are environmental factors. There are internal factors that will affect metabolism and even genetic factors that will cause changes in patients with polycystic ovary syndrome. In this summarized scheme of the pathophysiology of PCOS, we see both external as well as internal factors that contribute to uh, metabolic changes in patients with PCOS. So you have their epigenetic changes. So when we see epigenetic, these are uh, inheritable alterations in the genome and gene expression without any changes in the gene sequence. So you see there that there may be DNA hypo and hypermethylation that can cause irregular gene expression that may potentiate increased androgen secretion. There's also a hypothesis that there are environmental toxins that can actually induce okay, uh, disruptions no, in the endocrine system. So those include your, bi, uh, uh, your BPAs or your bisphenol A and your glycotoxins or your advanced glycated end products. There are also dietary factors that may contribute to insulin resistance that is characteristic of patients with PCOS. And we see that with hyperinsulinemia that we will be focusing on for this topic, uh, there will be changes in both the liver as well as in the ovaries that will affect okay, secretion of gonadotropins as well as secretions of androgens as you will go through uh, the meat of the talk in a while. So just a short review, these are the ways of diagnosing PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome. We have the 1990 US NIH diagnosis, the 2003 Rotterdam diagnosis, and the 2006 Androgen Excess PCOS Society. So primarily for the Rotterdam criteria, we see that oligoanovulation, clinical and or biochemical signs of androgen excess and polycystic ovarian morphology are part of the diagnostic criteria for PCOS. We have to remember that all criteria require the exclusion of similar mimicking disorders such as thyroid dysfunction, hyperprolactinemia, adrenal hyperplasia, androgen secreting tumors, and iatrogenic androgen excess, among others. So it's basically a diagnosis of exclusion. So for this particular talk, very important that we take note the different phenotypic classification of PCOS based on the Rotterdam criteria. So the PCOS uh, phenotype includes phenotypes A, B, C, and D. So as I've said, these are characterized by patients with hyperandrogenism and hirsutism, ovulatory dysfunction, and polycystic ovarian morphology. So that will be phenotype A, Phenotype B will be hyperandrogenism and hirsutism with ovulatory dysfunction. Phenotype C is hyperandrogenism and hirsutism with polycystic ovarian morphology. And phenotype D are those patients with ovulatory dysfunction and polycystic ovarian morphology. So what is common okay, in phenotypes A, B, and C that will be very important in our discussion is the presence of um, hyperandrogenism, okay, in all of these phenotypes. So if you will look again at the characteristics phenotype, particularly A and B, these are what we call the classic PCOS. And this is important, particularly for this topic, because insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, and risk for diabetes are seen mostly in phenotypes A and B.
So going back to insulin resistance in the pathophysiology of PCOS, we see here that insulin resistance is very important, particularly insulin resistance in the muscle and the liver. There may be some level of insulin abnormality in adipocyte dysfunction that will lead to hyperinsulinemia, and this will cause, as we'll explain later, ovulatory dysfunction. And this ovulatory dysfunction is due to hyper and uh, will characterize hyperandrogenism and follicular arrest. And this is due to adrenal androgen reduction in your sex hormone binding globulin. So that is why you have more free androgen or sex hormones in the circulation. And of course, we'll discuss later follicular arrest. Uh, causing your polycystic ovarian morphology. PCOS also is characterized by abnormal gonadotropin levels. So you have more uh, or elevated LH over FSH ratio. And this is because of the eventual feedback mechanism uh, to the GNRH. So again, since the topic is particularly insulin resistance or what we call insufficient real cell response to insulin, you have to remember that insulin resistance is in PCOS is independent of patient's adiposity, body fat topography, and androgen levels because we saw that we see in patients who are lean PCOS that insulin resistance may also occur. It is also noteworthy that insulin resistance is tissue-specific or selective in PCOS. You have insulin resistance in skeletal muscles, adipose tissue, and liver, but you have insulin sensitivity in the adrenal gland and in the ovaries. Insulin effectively stimulates ovarian follicular growth and hormone secretion by stimulating receptors in the follicular membrane cells. So that is uh, one of the effects of insulin in PCOS. So it triggers ovarian P450C17 and P450 enzyme, which promote ovarian steroid digenesis with synergistic effect on chorionic gonadotropin, as well as insulin growth factor one, which synergizes with luteinizing hormone and increases LH binding sites and androgen producing response to LH. That is why you have a higher LH FSH ratio. In addition, insulin resistance independently enhances your CYP17A1 activity, which is the enzyme in androstenedione and testosterone production. That is why patients with PCOS have hyperandrogenism. As I said earlier, hyperinsulinemia will cause a reduction in, in your hepatic sex hormone binding globulin, thus your free testosterone levels in the blood will be higher. It also inhibits your IGF-1 binding protein production in the liver, and IGF-1 is responsible for triggering the production of androgen in fecal cells. So that increased plasma concentration and increased production of androgen in fecal cells will result to hyperandrogenism. IGF-1 upregulation decreases specific um, miRNA and thus accelerates granulosa cell apoptosis and inhibits folliculogenesis, thus causing what we call your follicular arrest. And both hyperandrogenism and hyperinsulinemia, insulinemia, as I've said, plays a role in stopping follicular growth that will cause menstrual irregularity, anovulatory subfertility, and amassing of immature follicles. In addition, excessive insulin stimulates its receptor in the pituitary gland to release LH. So it stimulates your gonadotropin-releasing hormone and LH pulse secretion. So it also stimulates adipogenesis and lipogenesis and eventually inhibits lipolysis. And this will result in fat accumulation. And this leads to enhanced levels of free fatty acids affecting the liver and the adipose tissue. Eventually, hyperglycemia can lead to inflammation by producing your TNF-alpha from your mononuclear cells. So basically, in summary, this is the insulin resistance pathogenesis in patients with PCOS. So as you can see, hyperinsulinemia, which characterizes insulin resistance, will have changes in cholesterol metabolism. You have reduction in sex hormone binding globulin. You have dysglycemia because glucose transport will be affected that I will show later. There will be uh, abnormalities in the LH pulse and amplitude and increase ovarian and adrenal 
steroidogenesis, as you can see here, because of the activation of the enzyme causing raised androgen and eventual pre-testosterone because of the reduction in the transport protein. You have in this slide as well, risk factors for insulin resistance, and that would include abdominal obesity, family history of type 2 diabetes, genetic predisposition, aging, some drugs, and of course, lifestyle. So just a short review, this is what happens during insulin signaling. An example, in the adipose tissue, we all know that upon binding of insulin to the insulin receptor, which is a tyrosine kinase insulin receptor, there will be autophosphorylation of the kinase, okay, of the intracellular domain of the tyrosine kinase receptor. And this binding of the insulin to the receptor will activate your insulin receptor substrates or your IRS which forms docking sites for two pathways, your phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase and your MAPK kinase or your mitogen activated protein kinases. So the activation of your, RI, of your insulin substrate, um, receptor substrate through your um, phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase pathway will actually have a downstream signal transduction. Okay, so this downstream signal transduction will activate your protein kinase B, and this protein kinase B is responsible for the metabolic effects of insulin. This is where glucose transport will occur because of the okay, migration of the glucose transporter in the cell membrane. This, is, this will increase glycogen synthesis, lipogenesis, gluconeogenesis, and lipolysis. On the other hand, will be inhibited. When the MAPK kinase, the left downstream pathway will be activated, what we'll, saw, what we'll see are mitogenic effects. So these will cause regulation of cell growth, cell proliferation, differentiation, motility, and survival. So what happens particularly in, so these are the two pathways, your MAPK or your MEK and your phosphatidyl uh, uh, inositol pathway. So what happens in insulin resistance in the muscles in patients with PCOS? So as you can see in the illustration, you have their insulin and there, is recept there are the receptors. You see there again, the insulin receptor substrate Okay, uh, that will be phosphorylated. And you see now the activation, particularly of the mitogenic effect, the MEK or the MAFK pathway. However, the metabolic effects of insulin signaling is inhibited in patients with PCOS. So there is associated selective okay, insulin resistance affecting the metabolic but not the mitogenic signaling pathway, which might explain the paradox of the persistent reproductive action of insulin, and yet you know, there is uh, inadequate glucose metabolism regulation. So that is why you may have elevated blood sugars because the metabolic effect of insulin signaling is resistant you know, in patients with PCOS. There's also insulin resistance in the adipose tissue in PC, patients with PCOS, but not directly related to signal transduction. We're well familiar with increased inflammatory cytokines, your TNF-alpha, as well as your interleukin-6 in patients with PCOS, and this will cause a reduction in insulin-mediated glucose uptake. Okay, So in the uh, adipocytes, there is in decreased no, uptake of glucose. There's also altered adipokine levels. We all know that uh, this will eventually cause larger adipocytes, no, decreased lipoprotein lipase activity and impaired catecholamine-induced lipolysis. There's also GLUT4 um, or glucose transporter for reduction in the in the production, no? and that will be because of the affected insulin signaling. So there will be inhibit inhibition of lipolysis. There will be increased free fatty acid. There may be also alteration in miRNA expression. So there will be suppression of GLUT4 content and altering glucose transport. So these are the effects of insulin resistance in PCOS, particularly in the adipocytes. So that is why. Though in the Rotterdam criteria, you just need two or the th of the three features to diagnose um, PCOS, we see that in uh, patients with PCOS that there are concomitant insulin resistance. There's also concomitant cardiometabolic risk as well as obesity in most patients with insulin resistance and PCOS. So in a case uh, control observation, study of insulin resistance among patients with 
um, uh, PCOS, looking at the four phenotypes of the Rotterdam criteria, they looked at glucose metabolism profile of those patients with PCOS and control women. As you can see, now, in the different glucose metabolism parameters comparing PCOS and control patients, you will see that fasting glucose as well as a GTT may not be good enough test not to establish insulin resistance in patients with PCOS. So that uh, other tests which include your fasting insulin, two-hour insulin, your two-hour, your, your quickie test, your home IR, your home B or Matusda index, and even your fasting glucose, fasting insulin ratio may be important tests okay, to establish insulin resistance in PCOS. So again, fasting plasma glucose as well as an OGTT may not be enough tests to establish uh, insulin resistance in patients with PCOS. In this particular case control observation study, they looked at different measures of insulin resistance. So they diagnosed insulin resistance if they have fasting insulin levels of more than 20, fasting insulin uh, glucose insulin ratio, a two-hour two hour glucose two-hour insulin ratio, a HOMA IR using this formula, the qualitative insulin sensitivity check index using this formula, the HOMA B, um, using this formula as well and the Matusda insulin sensitivity index. So in this study, it showed that for patients with PCOS versus those without POS or controlled patients, that these techniques or these measures are important in establishing insulin resistance. So in this same analysis, they look at the clinical characteristic and metabolic profile of the different PCOS phenotype versus control women in E. So as you said, as I've said earlier, you have the phenotype A, B, C, and D. We said that phenotypes A, B, and some C, those phenotypes with hyperandrogenism are the ones with characteristic uh, um, uh, insulin resistance pattern compared to your phenotype letter D. And of course, compared to women who are controlled. So this is the distribution of insulin resistance, glucose tolerance, metabolic syndrome parameter, and family history of type 2 diabetes among PCO PCOS phenotypes and controls. So again, these are control, and these are the PCOS phenotypes. And when you compare PCOS and control, as well as for each of the phenotypes, you see the differences, okay? of the phenotypes with regards to insulin resistance parameters, fasting insulin, fasting glucose, fasting insulin ratio, HOMA IR, as well as ratio of your 2-hour glucose and your 2-hour insulin. So again, these are the tests that may can help you establish insulin resistance in patients with diabetes. So why is it important? We know that there are health consequences of PCOS, and there's a lot of those health consequences. So that would include your short-term complications, your uh, long-term complication. So particularly for this talk, we'll talk about metabolic dysfunction, again, in association to insulin resistance because um, uh, the lecture prior to this actually discussed most of the metabolic complications of insulin resistance uh, of uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. You see here the association or the degree of ovulatory and menstrual irregularity and the degree of insulin resistance. You see that for those patients with longer and ovulatory or longer menstrual irregularity, you see a linear relationship with regards to the mean adjusted home IR. So meaning the longer that you are, um, that you have oligoamenorrhea, okay, Okay, that you have amenorrhea, it, it uh, corresponds or it is directly related linearly to insulin resistance. In another analysis, when they look at metabolic syndrome in women with PCOS, you also see that the adjusted prevalence of metabolic syndrome in patients with PCOS are seen in those patients at phenotype A, B, and C versus that of D. And these patients, A, B, C, and D, as I've said, are those patients particularly with hyperandrogenism as part of the Rotterdam criteria. And this is important because if we again look at the clinical consequences, when you look at comp of MI, stroke, angina, revascularization, and CV mortality in the composite endpoints in this analysis, you will see that those patients you know, with PCOS compared to control have a higher risk for those events. M 
MI stroke angina revascular station and the adjusted risk is also significant no, for those endpoints. So that is why it's very important that we manage insulin resistance and PCOS in general for our patients, especially compared to control. Okay, so when they did uh, time-dependent Cox pro proportional hazard ratio for the composite endpoints, and they looked at particular variables, so weight increase prior type to diabetes and IMD score. So IMD or your index of multiple deprivation is an area-based measure of social and maternal deprivation. So the higher, okay, the quintile score. Okay, it means that the patient is more deprived. So that would include income and education. So as you can see, you know, in this hazards ratio, what is significant is your weight increase prior type 2 diabetes in uh, as well as uh, a high IMD score. So this analysis identified these three factors, weight increase, diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, and relative deprivation as significant factors. And these observations imply that prevention of weight gain, prevention of type 2 diabetes, and targeting resources and risk factors may be uh, important you know, to reduce or prevent cardiovascular disease in this uh, PCOS pa patient population. So how about specific treatment for insulin resistance? So the role of insulin sensitizers, as we can see here in the illustration, that there are several medications that can have direct effect as well as indirect effect on insulin resistance. So in a study looking at the impact of pharmacologic intervention on insulin resistance, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis or randomized controlled trial. When they look at comparisons of passing plasma glucose for metformin, you see significance in this forest plot for the favors reduction in fasting glucose for metformin, as well as uh, no effect or no, no, no difference for pioglitazone, okay, as well as for cetagliptine and orlistat versus placebo, and even at rice no, that favors placebo for atorvastatin, as we know for most of the statin. Uh, when they looked at comparison on fasting insulin, there was improvement or there was better um, uh, reductions no, with fasting insulin, with pioglitazone versus placebo, uh, as well as with metformin. There's no change or effect with cetagliptine as well as with orlistat and with atorvastatin. When they looked at other parameters, homeostatic model on insulin resistance, there was a trend for benefit with metformin as well as with pioglitazone, uh, no difference with cetagliptine as well as with orlistat and um, with acarbose. And when they looked at the homeostatic model assessment for beta cell function uh, for metformin, there was no difference. So in this meta-analysis, they concluded that the data pooled in the meta-analysis showed that pharmacological intervention, including metformin, pioglitazone, acarbose, and exenatide reduce fasting plasma glucose, fasting insulin, and HOMA IR, and some other therapeutic agents have no effect on the parameters of insulin resistance. Though they recommend that further clinical trials with rigorous methodology and sufficient power are needed for each of these pharmacological interventions. So currently, these are the present and potential future therapies for patients with PCOS. So we've identified life cell modification. There is data on ketogenic diet and uh, low carbohydrate diet. This could improve weight and hormonal profiles and fertility, as well as reduce insulin levels uh, that can help ovulation. There's also date, the different dietary composition, systemic review on moderate intensity, regular aerobic exercise that can also have significant effect on weight loss, improved menstrual irregularity and ovulation, and significant effects of exercise on metabolic, anthropometric, and cardiorespiratory outcomes. There are uh, data on metformin versus lifestyle showing reduction in BMI as well as reduction in androgen levels seen in the metformin group. RCTs on obese and morbidly obese women with PCOS also show significant decrease in BMI independent of lifestyle modification.
With regards to data on pioglitazone, there is significant reduction in fasting serum insulin and P androgen index, though uh, sex hormone binding globulin showed increase for metformin and pioglitazone. There's also improvement in ovulation in the pioglitazone group and significant overall reduction in insulin resistance and insulin resistance variability for those patients given pioglitazone, metformin, and orlistat. There's data in the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists for exenatide, liraglutide, and even the combination with metformin showing substantial benefit with regards to weight reduction in achieving BMI, significant improvement in insulin sensitivity, as well as anthropometric measures, and even decreased levels of testosterone. This is true even for liraglutide at 1.8 milligrams once a day, showing again significant reduction in weight and improvement in quality of life. Data on DPP-4 inhibitors in P uh, PCOS for cetagliptin, there is reduction in maximal glucose response to the oral glucose tolerance. Also, a potential treatment for those with, uh, with metformin intolerance because it has shown improved beta cell function and insulin sensitivity. Cetagliptin also in animal study can reduce fasting plasma glucose, lower androgen levels, and improved ovarian fibrosis in rats with PCOS. And even SGLT2 inhibitor, there's a 12-week randomized open-label study on empagliflozin showing significant anthropometric measures, though there were no changes in the metabolic parameters. There are also novel agents for PCOS. You have your myo-inositol, which plays a role as a structural foundation for second messengers in intracellular signaling pathways, as well as insulin signal transduction. So your myo-inositol-based second messenger activation increases the activity of glucose transport proteins and regulates glucose intake. Okay? So there are studies on prevention of GDM for infertile women with PCOS and the systematic review showing improved hormonal and reproductive problems, enhanced follicular development, and oocyte maturation. There's some data with atorvastatin which significantly reduce insulin resistance, inflammatory markers, and hyperandrogenemia that augments the effect of metformin, as well as significantly reducing levels of your androstenedione and your DEAs. Data on oily stat for improvement of insulin resistance, lipid profiles, weight, BMI, and waist circumference, and bariatric surgery where in menstruation was normalized for those with average weight loss of 41 kilograms that improved insulin resistance. Uh, this is a new publication in 2022, wherein they looked at repurposed medications for PCOS. You have there your astaxanthin, erbier berberine. These are basically dietary supplements, though the data are not uh, is not um, are not available. You also have uh, folic acid use in patients with PCOS, not together with your myo inositol. There's also studies on L-carnitine uh, for patients with PCOS, though results are not available, as well as use of your N-acetylcysteine no? uh, studies on, for PCOS, and even your resveratrol together with your myo-inositol, and even looking at the use of vitamin D no, in patients with PCOS. Okay. So last, since we've been talking about COVID and we're still in the pandemic, I'd like just to add that there is increased COVID-19 infection in women with polycystic ovary syndrome. At least this is what we saw in a population study among uh, uh, a primary care database in the United Kingdom. So you basically see here Okay, the, 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 the patients with PCOS and those without POS, and they were matched by age. And if you see... For example, the sensitivity analysis or the risk for suspect, suspected and confirmed COVID-19 among patients with PCOS versus those without PCOS, it is actually seen more in those patients of reproductive age. And since we're talking about insulin resistance, the presence of insulin resistance or it's, uh, may also uh, increase the risk of COVID-19 infection, particularly in women with PCOS compared to those women who are not. So these are risk factors for confirmed COVID-19 uh, patients with PCOS. So as you can see here, BMI is an important risk factor. 
uh, in this in this uh, group of patients as well as age. So in conclusion, this study showed that women with PCOS are at an increased risk for COVID-19 infection, except for obesity, the adjustment for potential confounding factors did not mitigate this risk, pointing to an inherent PCOS specific factor. So there are, do we need to explore the potential critical role of androgen in conveying the risk for PCOS and COVID and assess in more detail the contribution of ethnicity and socioeconomic deprivation in this analysis. So in summary, hopefully I was able to show you that there are various pathophysiologic mechanisms producing insulin resistance in different PCOS phenotypes and various ways in establishing presence of insulin resistance in these cohorts. There are short and long-term clinical consequences of insulin resistance in PCOS and treatment options to address these problems include established medications that can address insulin resistance and other repurposed medications that may have promise in addressing this disorder. And lastly, women with PCOS are at increased risk of COVID-19 infection, which could be due to an adherent PCOS-specific factor. So with that, thank you very much for your attention.